What's up everybody? My name is Adam McDormand and this is Medium Quality. So I'm back again to keep talking about progressive rock because you asked for it. Okay, maybe you didn't ask for it, but this is my YouTube channel and you have yet to stop me. In the last couple of videos about progressive rock, I talked about how I got introduced to the genre when a friend of my dad sent home a CD with a bunch of really good bass players on it. And then eventually that primed me to become completely enamored with Yes when I finally heard Close to the Edge. And how in between those two periods of time, I was subsisting on these burnt CDs that would just mysteriously and without warning descend from the heavens when my dad's friend would send a burnt CD home with him. And I really had no way of finding new progressive rock. This was well before the advent of high-speed internet. This was well, well before the ubiquity of streaming music services. If I wanted to hear about some new progressive rock, I didn't know where to look for it. It would just show up or I would find out about it almost by accident. And that put my experiences with progressive rock in sharp contrast to the other side of my musical interest. I mentioned before how my musical journey was like a two-lane highway. On one hand, I had my interest in mostly Christian pop punk and that graduated into harder and harder styles of music, but it was always communal. There was always someone that I knew, a friend, a bandmate who was introducing me to new music. And I have tons of stories to tell about where that led me. Meanwhile, my time with progressive rock was always very solitary, almost lonely in a way. In some sense, it was like this treasure was for me and me alone. And in a way that was cool because I had something that none of my other friends had. They weren't interested whenever I'd put on a Dream Theater CD for my hardcore friends. They were like, get this trash out of here. So I listened to it by myself. And I very, very rarely ever encountered another person who was into progressive rock. In fact, I could probably count the number of people that I have personally known who have been into prog rock on like one hand. And even those people were never people that I was close enough with that I got an opportunity to geek out about the latest Spock's Beard, Transatlantic, Symphony X, fill in the blank new progressive rock music. Eventually, in my late teens, peer-to-peer -peer sharing services like Napster and Kazaa and LimeWire and WinMX started to become popular. I would dial into the internet on my parents' computer with the 56k modem and try to find new music. Search for a song and you would get a list of users who had this song and, and what I would do was go to that user and see everything that they were sharing. See if they were sharing an entire album that I was familiar with and try to find other stuff that they were sharing and just hope that they would stay online long enough that I could download a single song, which might take 15, 20, 30 minutes. Sounds crazy, but that was what it was like to be into prog rock in the late 90s and to this day, I don't know any prog rock fans in real life. So let's talk about five prog rock albums that I discovered on my lonely journey. Now we're going to start with what may very well be grounds for an argument as to what constitutes progressive rock. This is I, Robot by the Alan Parsons Project. Now I say that because this bears very little resemblance to Close to the Edge by Yes or Selling England by the Pound by Genesis or even In the Court of the Crimson King by King Crimson. This album probably is funkier. It's more, dare I say, even proto-disco. I could be wrong about that. Don't at me. Alan Parsons is well known for being an extraordinary producer with some pretty big albums in his repertoire. And it's no surprise that when you get to his work with the Alan Parsons Project, that 
his attention to production details is probably front and center. And I think it's that intricacy and that attention to detail that makes this progressive. It is not simply a pop album. It is not simply a rock album. Uh, he brings a certain lavishness to this album that you see in those great progressive rock albums in the way that many of those albums are very detailed in their compositions. Um, this album is super, super listenable. If you are not a fan of progressive rock and you happen to be watching this video, this might be kind of a gateway drug in some sense. I absolutely love this album. This might actually be a no skips album for me. It's good. So if that was a potentially contested album in the prog rock canon, then let's pull something that is uncontested in that regard. This is Thick as a Brick by Jethro Tull. This album is basically just one song. This is an album that belongs on vinyl. I really don't know that you can get the same experience with Thick as a Brick without having this big form factor medium here, especially because this thing is made to look like a newspaper. It has all this extra ephemera included. You know, all the liner notes, the inner sleeves are, are newspaper stories that are connected to the music. And you could very easily spend the entire time that you're listening to this album also browsing the newspaper. Jethro Tull as a band is, is such an interesting progressive rock act because they were so often pushing against the prog rock identifier. I, I don't think that they wanted to be classified or pigeonholed as a prog rock band. I think I remember reading somewhere that for this album, Jethro Tull leaned so heavily into the self-indulgent excess of progressive rock as a way to kind of parody the genre a little bit and accidentally ended up making a seminal album in that genre. I don't know if that means this album constitutes a failure on the part of the band or just this emergent success. Either way, this is an album that you have to experience if you're a fan of progressive rock, preferably in this format so you can fully immerse yourself in the world of thick as a brick. Just do it. Just, just do it. Next up, we have an album that's a little bit off the beaten path. We have The Snow Goose by Camel. Now, this was an album that I picked up toward the beginning of the vinyl record resurgence of the mid-2010s. There, for just a short period of time, there was a local record shop around here that had a really, really good selection of prog rock and jazz fusion in particular. That was a time of great musical discovery for me because most of this stuff was not in enough demand that it was expensive. Like all these Camel records that I bought were basically impulse buys. I would go in and the guy who was working there, he knew a lot about jazz fusion and prog rock. And I'd be like, hey, like, what's good? What should I be checking out? He would throw something like this at me and it would be like three or four bucks. And it's like, okay, let's do it. And so I have this album. Have I spent a bunch of time with it? No, I haven't, but I have it. And it's probably really good. And I'm gonna listen to it some more and discover something new in my own collection. Next up, we have a more modern progressive rock record with porcupine trees up the downstair. I just happened to snag a copy of this album yesterday. I'm a big, big porcupine tree fan, but much of their discography is somewhat difficult to get a hold of for anything resembling a reasonable price. And that's for a couple of reasons. Obviously, a, a band that really hit their musical stride in the 90s was probably not pressing a lot of their stuff to vinyl. And now that the Porcupine Tree discography is slowly being reissued on vinyl, it's all coming from Burning Shed Records in the UK, and it's expensive to get this stuff shipped over to the United States. If you want to buy a Porcupine Tree record, you're going to pay a premium. And so whenever I see a Porcupine Tree record that I don't have at a local record store, 
I grab it up as quickly as I can. Now up the downstair was early enough in the career of Porcupine Tree that the band was really just Stephen Wilson. And he's sort of looking at Pink Floyd, but from the other side of the 80s. And in 1993, when this album came out, we're right on the cusp of some major changes in, in music. Like hair metal's over, grunge is about to happen. Um, there's less a focus on like shredding and more of a focus placed on building a kind of sonic experience. And that's why it seems to be reaching back through time, borrowing kind of the almost methodology of Pink Floyd, but applying that methodology to the tools, techniques, and musical tastes of Stephen Wilson. And you see that kind of spacious experimentation here, but almost tipping its hat a little bit toward what to come, toward a heavier, grungier kind of sound. In any case, I'm super glad I found this to help fill in a little blank spot in my Porcupine Tree collection. Obviously, if you want to hear me talk about Porcupine Tree more, I'd be happy to do so. Drop down in the comments and let me know. And lastly, an album of which we might ask, is this actually progressive rock? The Hazards of Love by The Decemberists. Now this might seem like a wild choice to include in a prog rock showcase, but I would argue that it's a perfect choice to include here, especially in a video where we've already talked about Jethro Tull. In some alternate universe where Jethro Tull is like the penultimate progressive rock band instead of Yes or Genesis or King Crimson or Rush, uh, this would be the legacy of progressive rock. This album features so many of the touchstones of classic progressive rock, it just doesn't sound like a progressive rock album. You could almost view this album as the opposite of Porcupine Tree, where we've traced the lineage of progressive rock all the way back to its English countryside roots, and then skipped the 80s completely and are left with a very earthy sounding album. You are not going to hear a single synthesizer on this thing. You are not going to hear a shredding electric guitar solo, but you will hear what I would describe as a very indie folk kind of sound, but with all of the grand ambition and fabled pomp of the early progressive rock bands. Is it progressive rock? Probably not. But would a progressive rock fan find a lot to love about this album? Absolutely. Don't take my word for it. Go find it on Spotify and listen to it. It's really good. Guys, that's gonna do it for this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you wanna see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you're really invested in what I'm doing on this YouTube channel, then I'm gonna put a link in the description section below where you can get some pretty cool medium quality merch. And until next time, guys, keep spinning that good stuff. What a time to be alive.